All right, cool. So hopefully you guys have attempted uh, the homework from last time. So I guess, first of all, like, do you guys have any questions from me, for me from the last workshop, what is R? Whether the problem the homework, you don't quite know how to efficiently do it or something like that. The second question on the homework, I could only okay. get from one to 100. I couldn't also get 900 to 1,000. Okay, so this part, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. Okay, create a data frame that has all even numbers. So you can tell I didn't actually attempt these. Like I tried to attempt it when I was designing it and I think it was doable, uh, let's see. So first of all, the part one is I want a data frame that has even numbers in one column and odd numbers in another column. Right. So basically what I need to do is, okay, I need one column to be a sequence from one to 1000 yep. and it's going to increase by two. Right. So I can get one, three, whatever. Yeah. Right. All so, the so odd numbers. Why is this not working? Oh, sequence one to 1000 like that. Yep. Right. So that has, that's all the odd numbers. And if I need the, all the even numbers, I could just start from two to a thousand, increasing by two, which mm -hmm. means my my df needs to be uh, data the frame. So odd is sequence one to one thousand, increase by two, and even is sequence one two to one thousand, to increasing by two. I think that's right. Okay, so now I have a data frame that looks like this, right? All the even numbers and all the odd numbers. Or I guess all the odd and all the even numbers. Okay, so now I say use this selection operator to get sub data frame such that it only contains numbers less than 100 or greater than 900. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the goal is I need to know, I need to first know which, which, uh, which of this data frame are my data that are greater than Oh, sorry, less than 100, right? So, Caroline, what did you do to get this? Um, so, I did, I like I said, I could only get 1 to 100, but what I did was um, my DF selection operator, and then I did a sequence from 1 to 50, comma, C, 1, 2. Mm -hmm. um, like, selecting oh. for both columns, and then... Uh, rows one to fifty. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay. I see. That's that's good. That's that's one way to do it. But it only got me one to a hundred. I couldn't. I I like tried a bunch of permutations and I couldn't also get nine hundred to a thousand. Okay. So you see how I say here? There's a hint. You can use logical values to to figure out like what to select. Okay, so I know that if I give R the condition, my DF is less than or equal to 100, it tells me which ones are less than or equal to 100 and which ones are not, right? Okay. Which means I can write, I can, I can do two conditions with an AND operator so that I can also look at my DF that is uh, greater than or equal to 900. And that would give me a data frame that contains what are true and what are false. I think you should. Oh, sorry, sorry. I mean, or operator. Yeah. <laughs> Not add. The moment I typed it out, I was like, oh, wait, no. Okay. So I use or operator. So you can see some true and some false. And then some truth again, right? Okay. Yeah. And I said, you can use logicals to, to put in your selection to tell you what to get, which means I'm going to do my condition. This is the condition I want. Mm -hmm. So. And I have the data frame I'm selecting from. With the selection operator, I put in the condition. Oh. And that gives me a data frame with the things that I wanted. Okay. Yeah, this becomes very handy when you're trying to select like a very specific set of sub data and you don't quite know how to filter it out or do like other operations with it. This is like a very raw way to do it without using packages. But really, I think oh. now the new data set is, uh, is only one column, right? Uh, 
I think so. I think it becomes a vector. Yeah. Right? I guess it becomes so. a vector. Yeah, it becomes a vector. You can see it here. Yeah. So if you want it to not be a vector, this is what you would do. You would say subdata. This, this, again, this is a very raw way to get you thinking about data. Data okay. frame. Okay. I want this thing, but I only want it to come from the first column. Right? So yeah. essentially, my, I have the selection here. And then I say, I just want it from the first column. column. Yeah. yeah. I think this will work. I'm not really sure. I didn't try this out. Uh, but I guess we'll see. Yep. So now I got a data frame called subdata and gives me the stuff I want. And then I oh, ended up with a lot of NAs for some reason. But eh. Cool. Yep. That makes sense. All right. Oh, it's because when I selected it, this part becomes NA and the other part becomes NA. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, because when I when I say, okay, just pick one column, like all of this stuff become NA and the other way around. And so when you put it together, it becomes like this. Got it. Make sense? All right. Any other questions? All right. Dope. So now let's get into ggplot2. So how many of you have heard of ggplot2 before? Here, all right, so no, ggplot2, no, all right. ggplot2 is all right. one of the most powerful. Was there powerful. a question? Oh, sorry. What? No, there's no question, I don't think, right? Okay, cool. So ggplot2 is one of the most powerful packages that you were using R to graph. Um, I'd say about like 50 to 70% of the graphs online that you will see are made by ggplot2 or maybe even more. Some people still stuck with, or they, they still stuck with the original base package. Um, they'll be using like the plot function, the box plot function, uh, things like that. You, you might see those come up in some classes if the instructor learned R at the very early stages when it first came out. Um, so ggplot2, what is ggplot2? It's this really powerful packages to give it 2D graphing power that can be separated among different dimensions. And we'll talk about what those dimensions mean later. Uh, so technically, even though what we're gonna do is 2D graphing, you can Im involve more than just two dimensions of data in it, right? You can put many, many dimensions and we'll see an example from the data that I collected from you guys when you signed up. Uh, and you can you can download the data from this link. It's a CSV file. Uh, you could also just run a code uh, that looks like this. I probably should have shown you guys this in the slides, but this is what it's called. It's called workshop data un under my directory. Okay. So to to even talk to to talk about ggplot, we have to kind of talk about how it's separated into different things. And to do that, I want to first show you as a motivation what ggplot can do. Right. So this is a graph that I have created where it, ha it tells you the correlation between age and the number of characters in full name. Okay. And I separated this graph into four groups using experience level that people f filled out. Now, I think 90% of people said what is R. Uh, some people said can do simple calculations. Some people say can do da basic data cleaning and can do cleaning, predictive modeling, blah, blah. I think I picked this one, and I think Alvin did too. So to, to just give you a background, I scaled this data up um, to 1,000 observations. Originally, they were like 25, and I just randomly sampled them into 100 observations. We won't really talk about what sampling does, but you'll see me do it multiple times throughout this workshop and the next couple ones. Okay, so this tell, what, what does this tell you? This tell you, okay, in ggplot, even though you're graphing just a normal data, I can have many dimensions, right? First, I have this experience dimension to separate my graphs. I have age, I have number of characters. So this is already three dimensions. I also have different colors for what you answer for suck to be, right? So that's another, that's uh, one, two, three, four. I, I lost count. Four, four dimensions. 
And then whether yes or no is whether you answer yes, I will do the homework or no, I won't do the homework, right? So that's five dimensions of data within this one uh, 2D graph. Right. Personally, I think that's like super cool. Right, that's very interesting. All right, so we'll talk about how to make this. Throughout this specific workshop, we'll go over each step and element that we're gonna use to build this exact graph. And it hopefully it'll be a clear enough example for you to really learn the what I call the anatomy of ggplot2. Okay. So first, let's look at the data. The data that I just loaded. Uh, it looks like this. In Tidyverse, I strongly recommend when you need to look at data set, you either just type the name out, so it'll give you something like this. Uh, I had it earlier. Let me just do data. So it'll give you like a, it'll just show you a table, which is kind of like a, a version of a data frame and what your data looks like. Or if you think there's not enough columns that you can look at, you can use glimpse, this function glimpse, that lets you look at kind of like a basic structure of your data. Uh, you can also choose to use the function str, which stands for structure. Uh, but personally, I like glimpse a little better just because I have a better look at what's going on in orderly. Okay, so in this data frame, you'll see that I have timestamps as characters, uh, whether people want to attend the workshop as characters, yes, maybe no. I have the days that people are available, the models that you will want to do for the workshop, the times, the county, blah, blah, blah. And then you can see I have age, which is a numeric vector, or a numeric column in this data frame. And then I have the rest are like characters. And then you can see that there is a column called characters, but it's, but it's like, so this characters is like the character count of your name, of your full name. That's one of the questions that we ask. You can see it's a character, but it has a lot of numbers. So first you want to think, why are these numbers getting imported as characters, right? So uh, I think I didn't change this one, so let's see. So we can look at R and say, okay, I want you to give me a summary on data as a column characters, All right? So it tells me, okay, it's length 1976, classic mode character, or class is character, mode is character. And then that doesn't really help us that much. So the next thing I want to do is to just look at what are the distinct values within this column, right? This is kind of like the first step to troubleshooting your data. What is the thing that's popping out to tell you that something went wrong, right? So I can say um, distinct. Right. So this is a tidyverse package. Sorry, this is a tidy tidyverse function. We won't really talk about this uh, except when it's implicitly used, but just know it exists. So I can say, I want to find a dis I want to find the distinct values in the data frame data under the column characters. So it tells me, okay, the distinct values in this character column is a bunch of numbers and this value y. So somebody answered y in the survey, even though I said enter the you know character counts of your name. So things like this happen all the time when you're dealing with real world data. So I can see I have all these numbers and this one thing that doesn't really give me any information, all right? So what I'm thinking right now is, oh, at this point, it's probably okay for me to lose this information, why, and make everything else a number. Or if you want to be even more conservative, you can say you create a new column based on this character column um, that has just numeric. So you still preserve the information here, but you kind of mirror the numeric information onto a different column so you don't actually lose that information if you need it later, All right? And the rest are like text data, okay. So what this tells us is we have this character thing, which means we can just change this uh, column into a numeric column back into our data. Okay, so recall that this, this dollar sign here is a column selection operator. So I said in the data frame data, I want to select the column characters. And then I'm gonna make this thing. So, sorry, let's call it this here. So data select characters. And I want to make this column a numeric column. So right now basically what's happening is I selected a column 
and I make it numeric, so now this thing is a vector. And I want it to replace the original characters column. I want to replace it. So now the data from that part will be numeric. Now I realize it says warning, and it's introduced by coercion. It's because this thing says Y, and what I do as numeric on Y, it becomes an A. Because I'm like forcing it to be numeric. So now if we look at the data type, the class, or sorry, value type or class of data, uh, the characters column, we get numeric. All right, so now that data is a numeric value instead of a character value. So our data is ready. So our data is ready, and we can look at the four basic elements of ggplot now. Oh, and just so you know, so when I when I look at a full graph in this workshop, when I look at a full graph, I'm going to call it a figure, and I might slip sometimes. So just correct me if you need to. Uh, and the contents of the figure graphs. Right, so if I look at a, if I'm looking at a scatter plot, the scatter plot itself what we call a, flip, a figure or a plot, uh, and the dots in the scatter plot, I'll just call it a graph. This is just to kind of more distinctly talk about what I what I'm talking about. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. All right. So the first anatomy of ggplot is the graphing device, the ggplot function itself. So in your graphing device, in your ggplot function, uh, the basic call is ggplot as a function. The data set you're using, you have to specify it. So data equals to data, data equals to something that you're using. And then this AES sub function, it's called the aesthetic. It stands for aesthetic. And inside aesthetic, you will have your x covariate, you'll have your, I guess, x axis, you have your y axis, and then you have Many, many different aesthetics that you can put in. Uh, I listed some that are like very common. Uh, Cause color, fill, size, alpha, shape, label, uh, stuff like that. And I'll talk about what these individual characteristics mean. Okay, so X and Y make sense, right? It's like when you're graphing something, you have X, you have Y. Um, when, it, when you're graphing like more complicated graphs, you can even flip your axis after you graph it just to create like different things. You can distort your axis to make a, a pie chart, and just random stuff like that, but not very practical for me to just all go over it right now. Okay. So just to kind of give you like an idea. In aesthetic, you will, spec you, you will specify what you want to go into the aesthetics of the graph. Like for example, you can say, okay, let's look at color. We can specify color by a factor variable. Remember a factor is strings that are ordered. So when you have the ordered value, you can actually specify a color palette to it for it to you know, do stuff. And that's only when it's like ordered, which is pretty important. Okay, on the other hand, if your color is specified not by a factor, but rather a numeric, right? So if I specify the color by age, but, and, oh, oh that's not age, so. So if I specify it by age, I get all these numbers, right? This is, these are all numeric. It'll just take from the palette I specified or the default palette um, and make a kind of like a spectrum of colors for you to use. Or you can say, I don't, I don't want to deal with all that. I just want this one color on my graph. You can specify the color either with words like red, black, blue, green, whatever. Or you can use color codes like RGB. Um, I think you can use the the one I can forgot what it's called, but it's like hashtag two digit two digit two digit. Okay. It gives you two fifty six. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. All right. Oh, that won't be okay. So these are the common aesthetics. Aesthetics. I'll go over them. So we talked about color. Color specifies the exterior color. So whenever you see a graph, I want you to think about this graph as it has an outside and it has an inside, right? It has the kind of like the borders. If you think of like Microsoft, uh, uh, not Microsoft, but you know the Windows Painter thing that we used to play with as a kid, right? You, get, you always have like a border thing and then you have an infill, right? So color is this border, right? We're drawing the thing. Like if you draw a square, you have the border. Color will specify that border's color. 
And then okay. fill will specify the infill of that graph that you're using, right? But this is not always the case. Sometimes when you're graphing something, um, the thing you picked might only have border and not have an infill. So the default shape in, uh, in when you're graphing a scatter plot would be a shape that does not have infill. So anything you specify for that color should be in color and not in fill, right? But you can also choose a different shape which has uh, a border and, and an infill and then you can specify both of them. Or you, I think you could specify like a shape that's only hollowed so it only has a border and the infill is empty. So all of these are possible. So that's kind of like the main difference between color and fill. Now, when there's no fill in a graphing, in a graph, in a graphing element, uh, default is to like deal with color. So if you don't know what you're dealing with, just play with color first. And if it didn't show the change you want and you're sure your code is right, then change the fill and see what happens. All right, next thing I want to talk about is alpha. Alpha is um, opacity, opacity of a graph. Right, so alpha alpha equals to one is the full opacity, which means it's not transparent at all. And alpha equals zero will make your graph transparent, like completely, which means like you probably can't see it. Um, what this does is if I'm looking at a bunch of data points and some of the data points, I want to give it more weight on my visualization and some a little less weight, I just don't want to, I don't think it's that important. Right, I can use I can specify alpha using the weight in the weight condition that I want to tell the to tell ggplot um, what are the parts of the graphs that I wanted to be showing more and what are the parts I want to show less. Right, and the other way another way to use alpha is to say I have two graphs that are overlapping, so I'm doing a histogram, and they're overlapping, but I want to see exactly how they're overlapping. Then I can specify alpha to be like 0 0.5, so I can see exactly the area they're overlapping. If that makes sense. Size is pretty self-explanatory. It takes a numeric value and changes the size of your graph, right? So like size 10 in a scatter plot would be like really big dots. Size 0 0.5 would be like really tiny dots. And you just kind of have to play around with it to see how big the dots become. Now shape is the characteristic that cannot be specified by a continuous variable because there are a total of 15 shapes. Maybe 20, I'm not super sure. I have to look this up. But just, just, just so you know, there's a lot of different shapes. And these shapes are actually like kind of like recurring shapes. What, what do I mean by that? So in general, you have like circle, you have um, triangle, square, right, you have triangle, rectangle, stars, you know, different things like that. And you will actually specify your shape either with a factor variable or you have to specify it by an actual number. Uh, and there's a list of them, what each number is uh, to tell you the shape. And then, so there's these basic shapes. And then there's another set of shapes that are the exact same things, except it has a border and a fill. And it has a border and an infill. And there's another set of shapes that are like on the same like number spectrum, whatever you call it. Um, and you can make them hollowed, uh, just like the border and no infill. But the default is just color so it's filled but it's all filled with the borders color that makes sense and you can feel free to play around with it i personally don't find it that helpful like usually when i need to, when i get to the point where i have to change shapes like i wouldn't really do it i'll just find a different aesthetic or a facet to change but i'll talk about facet means later but i'll just find something else to change because shapes are not that distinguishable when you're dealing with a lot of uh, dimensions any questions so far all right, cool. All right, label. Label is a really cool thing. Um, you're, you'll only use it when you're using geotext or geom label. Uh, I'll talk about what geom means in a bit. But you'll only use it in like very specific uh, condition where you want your data points, instead of being a specific shape, you want them to be num uh, words. You want them to be text to tell you. And I'll kind of show you what that would look like. Uh, I have a graph. So this is from my own research. Uh, see if I have this, yeah, there we go. So this is from my own research. This is a graph of sanctuary cities. Oh, I see. Okay, it's, and it's really tiny. So you might not be able to see, it, but so basically I have all these, I have all these fills for my area plot, which tells me like how many pumas are inside the sanctuary city. 
Puma is like a subsidy geography. Yeah. We like actually like Puma the animal. No, no. Puma means public use micro area data. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, not Puma the animal. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's a it's a fair question. I when I'm like googling Puma, trying to find like the exact definition to write down, it gets hard. Okay. So I specified a label for geom text. So on this area, it tells me which color area is from what city, right? So this is Chicago, Hartford, Connecticut, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Providence, Rhode Island, San Jose, California, right? It does all this stuff. So basically, it doesn't really tell me more than these colors, but these colors can also be really confusing, right? I have a spectrum of colors that I'm using and I have so many cities and Pumas. So this is the time where, oh, I'm just gonna put in like a city name so I can like see exactly what it is to be better like clarified. That's kind of what GeoMetrics is for. And that comes from like labeling and stuff. Make sense? Right. Yeah. That's just kind of an example of a very complicated graph. All right, so if we go back to the example for this workshop, right now we can graph the plot, graph most of the plot. All right, remember from from a while ago, let's see if I can find it, there we go. So I know I have, how many aesthetics, aesthetics do I have? Well, I have X, I have Y, so now I have two aesthetics. I have all these different colors, so this is, this is one dimension, so this is another aesthetic, right? And then I see these yes and no's, so that's a fourth aesthetic. So right now we can grab these fourth, four aesthetics, right? I have X, Y, color, and label. For aesthetics that I can graph. Ah, I showed it too fast. Okay. <laughs> so this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna say, all right, I'm gonna call a ggplot function in the graphing device. I'm using data as my data. I have my aesthetics where x, my x-axis is age, my y-axis is characters. My color is gonna be as that factor social, which is like what you think the social community's name is spelled. And my label is gonna be whether people want to do homework, as that factor homework. Okay, so what should I see on this graph? Based on what you know so far, what should I see on this graph? Colors. Sorry, can you say what care? I'm so sorry. I was doing something else for a moment. I'm so sorry. Can you say what social means? Oh, what yeah. people think the social community's name is spelled. So whether it's SSGSAC, SUCSAC, or Vanessa. Okay, well, um, so, and then characters is how many characters. So I guess you'll see like something that has like two discrete here, and then you have like these two factors, but I don't know where you're going to go with it in terms of discrete, discrete, like you, your next thing. So. I mean, color color is discrete because it can specify different colors, um, and label is discrete because you have like the actual text. Characters here is a numeric vector, right? This is a number because we changed it from characters into numbers earlier. The geom. So the answer. Hmm. We ha we haven't done anything with geom yet. Okay. So this is actually a trick question, and I set it up this way. Oh, when you no. graph this thing, when you run this function, you will actually get nothing. You get the x-axis, you get the y-axis, but you'll get nothing. And you're probably like, wait, why? I already specified what's supposed to go into my ggplot. What's happening? What's happening is we still need to tell ggraph what to graph. And that's the job for the geom functions. Exciting, right? This is like, ooh. Okay. So the next anatomy of ggplot is geom functions. It's in the form of geom underscore whatever thing that you're trying to graph and then parentheses as a function. So geom functions look like this. And to specify which geom function to use, you would just replace these dot 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 with the thing you're using, whether it's like geom, you know, geom point for scatter plot, geom line for line plot, geom area for area plot, box plot for box plot things like that. And to do it, you will, after you specify your graphing device, you would just do a plus 
G O. Uh huh. And this is actually really cool, and a lot of people don't talk about this, is that when you're graphing things with ggplot, the graph itself is not actually the output of your function. The graph is a byproduct of your function, and the output is something you just don't see. And like, I mean, it's just a cool thing to mention. It's not particularly useful in terms of graphing. Yes, Caroline. Um, what goes inside the geom function? inside the parentheses of the GM function. I will talk about it. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it depends on which, depends on which GM function you're using. Okay. Uh, you, you sometimes you want to check like the, the functions documentation to, to know, oh, what just happened? Ooh. Oh, there we go. Ah, if, if you press W, it changes from white screen to normal screen. I did not know that. Okay, so for example, uh, I, I think this will be too small for you guys to see, but I can say geom point. And then it tells you like what arguments there are and how do you use them. Okay. All right. So the most commonly seen geom functions that you see are geom point that's made for a scatter plot. Sometimes you will see geom jitter. Jitter plots are kind of like scatter plots, but they're less accurate, like they're less precise. So it could be like it could be like the same point, but when you're doing jitter, it scatters the same point around that point. So you so it's kind of to look at frequency and not just where uh -huh. it is. Yeah. So it gives you like a, a another dimension added for frequency, basically. Uh, I personally don't use jitter plot because when I'm graphing a scatter plot, I don't I want to see accurate data. <laughs> but sometimes if you want to look at how things are distributed, like 2D wise, you might want to use jitter. Uh, another common one is geom smooth. Smooth basically gives you gives you a um, fitted function, right? So if I have many dots, you know, scattered around the place, it finds like the fit for. If you specify lm for the method, you get this like straight line because it's a linear model. Uh, if you specify uh, if you don't specify anything, or if you specify lowest lesss, it gives you this fitted curve that goes to it. And we'll see, we'll see an example of that. Um, GeoLine gives you line plots that connects the dots. So it's not like a fitted line, but it gives you like a connected dots, which you can use to see like the progression of something. That's what a line plot would be. Um, if you use geom bar, I forgot the parentheses here. But if you use geom bar, you'll get like a bar graph. If you use geom histogram, you'll get a histogram of things uh, that's distributed with, I think the default for histogram is density. I need to check on that. Maybe it's count. I think it's count. I'm not super sure, but they're sometimes they're interchangeable in the sense that like it still shows the distribution in the same way. Geom text you've already seen labels your data points when you're doing with like an area plot, scatter plot, things like that. Okay, so geom function acts similar to geom point. Oh, this is supposed to be geom text function. I missed the word here. This geom text function is similar to geopoint, but instead of giving you dots, it gives you labels, like we already talked about. There, obviously, there's a lot more geom function that you should explore in the package. Um, just have fun with it. I think at the end of the workshop, I attached like a ggplot cheat sheet that you can look at to see like what functions there are and what you can use them for. All right, so going back to this example. Willie, Earlier, I I yes, yes. Um, so you don't have to address this question at this time, but okay. um, I feel like I need to know how to look up things. Like if I don't know how to ah. do something, I want to know how to look it up. And I understand like the question mark and then you, you put the function, but it tells you, you have to know what the function is, you know? I see. Uh, honestly, Google them, right? Just, cool. just write R need to do this or R do this, R do that. Um, okay. If you're using a specific package, you can say, oh, does it do this? Does it do that uh, with the package name, right? So if I want to say, let's say, let's say, this is, you know, this is good. So you can like actually ask questions online or find things. Say I want to know if I have a graph that somehow I need two different axes on two sides, right? There's a first axis, first y axis and the second y axis. What do I do? So I can say, all right, uh, GG. I can search ggplot2 
uh, second axis, right? And it'll take you to a bunch of random web pages like RPUBs, which is where a lot of people put their R stuff online. Uh, you can see, sometimes you can see their own like function documentation online. Uh, people will ask questions on Stack Overflow, which is like a very common place to find coding and math stuff. Right, so let's say, okay, I'm gonna look at this. And people will ask their questions and then people will answer them on like what code to use or what resources they can look at to find these things. And people will like specify stuff, right? And this is a really good way to like learn and understand what's happening, what happened between different updates or versions of R too. Cool. Cool. Thank you. All right, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, that's great, thank you. All right. So now we get to this point where we know that Earlier, I tricked you with this thing, right? I have just this part. And we found out that this doesn't graph anything because we didn't, spec we didn't specify anything for it to graph. Now, the arguments inside these geom functions are very different by each function. That's why I can only like kind of generally talk about what's in them and like what I usually use them for. So in general, when you call a geom function, it actually has, by default, it has data equals to data passed from the graphing device. Uh, it has aesthetics passed from the graphing device, but those things you can always change, right? Remember the default value is just written there so it can just take it easily, but you can always override it with whatever you want. And we'll see an example later where I have to constantly override what's going on to make a graph exactly how I want it. Uh, we'll see it in the, in the data part of the workshop, not the ggplot part. Okay, so here I call geon smooth, which means I want a fitted line. Uh, I say SE equals to false. If, it, if SE, SE is by default true, and if it's true, instead of just a line, it'll show you a line and the bandwidth of the standard errors of where things are distributed. Just kind of like how wide these things are distributed. Uh, so here I said SE equals to false, and my method specified is LM, which is a linear model, which means it's just gonna give me a straight line instead of a curve. I also specify a geom point, so it gives me a different point, and I specify a geom text, and tell it to do show that legend true. I actually was tinkering with this and I couldn't figure out how it actually works. I was trying to show a legend that tells you what this like yes, no means, but I couldn't get it to work at the time of writing this. So I just kind of left it there. But just so you know, like you can put in like random different things into it to graph. Okay, so now I have this code, what graph should I get? The original graph that you had? Yeah. The original, like the, the ultra original? Well, the one that you showed us. So, no, well, really this one close. has the GM smooth though. So, and your method is LM. So, it's going to be in the point. So, it's going to show us that like fitting line. No? Yeah. Am I looking a, at the right straight, thing? It's a straight fitted line, right? Oh, sorry, sorry. So, LM. I'm so sorry. Yeah. So, like, this is the original graph I showed, right? These oh, straight so lines sorry. came from yes, smooth right. LM. No worries, no worries. These straight lines came from smooth LM, right? Now, if I were to change it to geom mm -hmm. line, it would connect these points for me. Right. Sorry, I, because like, you know, you can do like different methods and I wasn't thinking, of course, LM should be like yeah, yeah. algebraic, just like homework. Yeah, if, if, it, if it's curvy, it's uh, lowest. Usually it lets me do that, whatever. Okay, so this is the graph it's supposed to give me. I have my x-axis, I have my y-axis, I have my color aesthetics, and I have my labels, all right? And these are linear, okay? But what you realize next is, well, I want to change the name of this. I'm not gonna show people my graph as as that factor social. I want to give it a name to tell people what it actually means. Right, age looks kind of ugly, characters looks kind of ugly. I want to be able to describe them. And also this graph has no title. How do I specify a title? And that's the next element, the third element of ggplot2, which is your scale functions. Yeah. Scale functions. So in scale function, you'll look, you'll see scale, underscore, something, underscore, something else. This, um, the first underscore 
lets you specify which aesthetics you're trying to scale. And the third, the, the second underscore, the third spot here, lets you specify what type of values this aesthetic is. So whether it's a discrete value, it's a continuous value, or is it manual, which means that you're just gonna specify it within the function call. Scale functions. Like I said, it will be scale, aesthetics, variable types. It's the general call. So uh, in the variable type, you'll have continuous value, discrete value, and manual. Manual just lets you not like override what is ha happening. It allows you to be more flexible because it has less default options in it, but it also allows you to have, or it also requires you to know more about what you're trying to do to actually use manual or sometimes it can, things can go wrong and then I can just, I should just go back to continuous or discrete. All right, and make sure that when you do, so this back in this graph, this means if I want to give this thing a name, I need scale, this aesthetic is color, and these values are discrete, right? So to scale this thing, to, to give this thing a name, to give this legend a name, what function do I need? I'm so sorry, but you could do maybe labs and then you could put like the all the titles and then they have like a one that you could put for like the little legend. So labs is very useful, but at the same time, it's it kind of overwrites some of the things and things can go wrong sometimes. It requires you to be very careful if you're dealing with legends. What I'm talking about right now is to use a scale function. So how do I manually specify just this one thing? Remember, I have scale, aesthetic, variable type, right? Yeah. Which means to alter this legend, I need scale. I need scale. What, what aesthetic? What aesthetic am I trying to do? No, you're good. You're good. I am so sorry so, that I cut you off five times. I, I just oh. thought you're asking a question. I'm so sorry. I was not trying to be rude, but sometimes it gets like a lag. I'm so sorry. I'm just not gonna say anything now. Uh, no, no, you, you're okay. You're okay. You should always say things. It's okay to cut me off all the time. Like this is very commonly practiced in econ to just interrupt anybody. Yeah. Very commonly practiced. So go ahead. Okay. So this is a color aesthetic, right? When I yeah. specified it. I remember my social call is as that factor social inside color which means to deal with this thing, I need scale. Scale, color. They said this is color, so I need scale, color. This is a discrete value variable. So I need scale, color, discrete. discrete. Okay. okay, just to give you an idea. Right, here I have scale, color, discrete. And originally the graph says, um, Guess social committee's name. Uh, guess guesses on social committee's name. So I use scale scale color discrete, and I want to change the name of the legend to this text string. Um, this backslash n is to tell R to split it into the next line. It's like an HTML thing, I think. But it, it lets you split it into the next line. So what this will look like is to say guess on social committee's name instead of saying as that factor is social. It'll actually say words that's understandable. Outside of using scale function, you will use labs, which is what Tatiana was talking about. In labs, because like I said, things can go wrong sometimes. Usually I only do title, which is the name of your figure, uh, the X axis name that you want and the Y axis name that you want for the axis. Okay, so that's what labs is for. So, with these knowledge that you have, with these knowledge that you have, we can now graph this graph, which is the same thing from the first element, the same thing from the second element. And now we have scale color discrete that says guesses on social committee's name. And uh, I just, I use this guide legend. It just tells the, it tells R to put my legend into four columns. Um, right? 
from what I remember, this thing didn't actually work out. Oh, you know what this, why this didn't work out? Because this says fill. If I wanted to change, I should have used color. If I had to use color to split it into four columns. All right, if I say color, it'll do that. If I say fill, because it didn't specify a fill here, nothing's gonna happen. Cool. I see. And I say, all right, I want the title of this graph or this figure, or the title of this figure to be correlation between age and number of characters in full name. X axis is age, Y axis is number of characters, which means when I graph it, it'll look like this, all right? This is what we're expecting. Guess is on social community's name, age capitalized, number of characters capitalized, and a graph title, all right? So, so far, this is what we have done. This is what we have shown. Okay, but earlier you saw that I split my graph into four graphs to show like different kind of uh, like a different dimension of data. To do that, that's more intricate, right? Like right now, this is technically this is already a full graph that you'd want. Right? You can see this in like a published paper and stuff. But you can even make your graph you can make your graph even better adding facets, facet functions. What's facet functions? Facet function looks like this: facet underscore dot dot. These data can be null, wrap, grid. To be honest, I don't really know the difference between them. I've always just used facet, facet wrap. It was easier for me to use. They have some specific characteristics that I just never needed. So I'm not that good at it. But just so you know, you can use it. In your facet call, you'll have variable one against, against variable two. If you just have one variable that you want to split your graph as, then you would do variable one against dot or dot against variable one, depending on which direction you wanted to facet. Again, you have facet wrap, facet null, facet grid. And you can specify your number of columns and rows you wanted to facet in. So like, for example, when I was doing this, uh, this graph at the beginning, I don't want to go all the way back, but when I was doing the graph on the beginning, it's like four graphs, right? Yep. So by default, it could also be four graphs right next to each other, one, two, three, four. It could be lie on top of each other, one, two, three, four. But I forced it and say, I just want two columns or maybe two rows. I can't remember what I specified, probably two columns because that's what I typed down. I can specify two columns, which gives me two columns. So one, two, three, four to make a square graph. I'll square figure, right? So now after all this stuff, I added, oh, I don't know what is in the middle, but all the stuff are the same from before, but now I faceted this by, ex by the experience level. And remember experience is a text string, which in my default, in my default in R is string as factor is true, which means this text string is treated as a factor, factor variable. But in your case, you also want to specify factor or ask a factor to make sure that EXP is treated as a factor in when you're graphing. So it can actually give you a level. And remember when we're doing factors, we can specify what levels we want our factors to be. Yeah. So I say, okay, I'm gonna factor it instead of by alphabetical order, I'm gonna factor it by the experience level it represents. So what is R? Can do simple calculation, can do basic cleaning, can do cleaning and predictive modeling. All right, the four level of the experiences that I chose or like a letter order. So this whole big thing is variable two, right? Remember the call is variable one against variable two and the other stuff. I actually specify row here. So n row equals to two. So there's nothing here against factor. Uh, sometimes I'll also put a dot here. It makes a difference. I can't tell you exactly what the difference is, but I just kind of try them out when I need to, to figure out what graph I want. So now what we should see is this graph, which is the original graph I showed, right? It has the title, it has the axis name, it has a legend's name, and it's split into four experience levels. Now, uh, I think I talked about it because there's six more pages, but yes. Okay, so now you'll notice underneath these yes and no, there's a dot, which makes it kind of ugly, right? There's like dots under this, mm -hmm. under these words. And it's because I specified a geom point 
function for it to be a scatter plot. And then I use a geom text, which put the label over the scatter plot, but the points are still there. So to, mo to make it more legible, I can take away geom point, right? I just commented out geom point. So I think I talked about this last time, when, there's a, when you have like a chunk of code and there's like a specific line you don't want to run, you add a hashtag next to it and it comments it out, which means that line will not be evaluated. So I commented out geo point, which means now, and it didn't change anything else. Now my graph would just have yes and no and not a dot between them or behind them, right? So we'll just get yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, and stuff like that. Make sense? Yep. Cool. All right, so this is the end of the first half today and we'll take like a short break so you can kind of regroup and not like just bulldoze through everything. I think that's you know pretty good, right? It's good to have like a little break. Uh, in the next, in the next one, we will actually not talk about tidyverse. We'll talk about um, basic idea of data, how data works, what are we doing with data. That's what we'll do um, after this break. Um, but like always, there's going to be a homework, and the homework this time is really long. So I would try. I would encourage you to really try it out. Um, this is a uh, this data set is actually re data from my own research. Uh, I sample I sub sampled it so it's a lot smaller by city. Uh, the original data set has like 54 million observations, but obviously I'm not gonna overload your computer with that. So I made it like I think 10,000 maybe 1,000 I can't remember. But you can use this data set and play with this city level data and I tell you how to graph things. And in this homework, you also learn how to graph like a specific numeric value onto the map of the United States, either by county level or by, or by state level. So it's pretty cool to play with. Um, and I actually tried this one out, so I know it's doable. And then the other one is uh, just uh, data from the first homework uh, that I gave you for you to practice graphing density, um, geom point and geom jitter. So try these things at home, it'll be really fun. And we'll take what, like a five minute break, get some water, all right. How do I stop recording? There we go. All right, cool. So something that Hal mentioned earlier uh, to me during the break is that, how do you save this graph? How do you save it? Okay, and this is how. So this is, this is from the slides. I guess this, this is from the slides. Let me read in the data. This is my graph, right? So there's two ways to save this. One is I can click on this thing and then, oh, this did not work as I'd expected. Uh, oh, I changed the settings of my R Studio. So usually when you run a graph, your graph is supposed to come out in the viewer. Actually, maybe if I just run this code, maybe it'll happen. Let's see. Okay, so it came out to be here, right? Usually when you run a ggplot in your console, you'll get this. Then you can click on export and you can save it as image. Or another way that you can do it much, 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 much faster is to add a function called gg save. You'll specify the path you wanted to save to. So for example, I can say I want to save to under root desktop, desktop, and then I, what, what you want it to be called. So say I want to say just test.jpg. Right, so I run this function and it's just going to save it. After it's done, it's going to save it onto my desktop. I can go look at my desktop. It'll be there. Yep. So that's how you would save a graph that you graphed. Um, obviously, you you can see that this is a lot less crowded. It might just you might think it's ugly, whatever. So you can change the size of this by specifying different things. All right. So if we look at gg save, you'll see you can specify. You have to specify the file name, which includes your path, uh, what plot you're plotting. Which if you just use plus gg save, it'll be the plot that you. You just plotted, um, 
and then you can specify the scale, how big you want it to be. You can specify the width and height, which gives you like the actual dimensions of your graph. Uh, you can specify DPI, which is like kind of like the resolution of your graph. So all of these are specifiable. Cool. Does that answer your question, Hal? Yeah, of course. All right. Cool. So now 